Our first speaker is John Gus Gustafson, a longtime member of the Mountaineer Mountaineers, and uh, I think it's safe to say he's an enthusiast of rock climbing. He lives just 100 yards or so from me, but I hadn't met him until uh, I got involved with the Mountaineer. So I've been super glad to meet him and Sarah and uh, get to know him and uh, really find his uh, enthusiasm for climbing uh, infectious. And he's um, offered to take my sons out climbing. They enjoy indoor climbing, but they haven't gone outdoors. So uh, he's offered uh, to take them along and introduce them to it. So let me just say, uh, let's welcome John Gustafson. Hey, thank you, Rod. Um, I assume people can hear me. I can hear myself. Yes. And I hope everyone's um, staying safe and sane and getting your outdoor fix where you can. It seems like from some of the trip reports that's happening. Um, I have to admit that Zach and his introduction, when he promised five exciting talks, I really felt like he was putting the pressure on. But then Melanie and in her intro said these were going to be short talks, and I can promise that. So this talk covers two overnight trips to a crag in southern Colorado near the town of Manassa. In 2019, I went there with Steve Renault and Ron Morgan. And in 2020, I went with Steve and Norbert Enslin. Well, I'll start. The previous slide was a map. And it showed that Manassa is in between Antonito and Alamosa. And the crag is then about another 10 miles east of Manassa. The drive is really mellow. It takes two hours and 15 minutes from the White Rock Y to the parking lot at the crag. And this is short enough to even to consider this for a day trip, though so we stayed overnight to maximize our climbing. And Manassas' claim to fame is as the birthplace of Jack Dempsey, who was the one-time heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Dempsey was known as the Manassa Mauler, and the town maintains a small museum dedicated to him with a bronze statue out front. And I think I read somewhere that the museum is actually his childhood home that they moved to this uh, location on Main Street. Okay, and I'm hoping my slide advances. Uh, apologies. Yeah. Do I have any technical support in the room? Yeah, what can I do for you, John? I don't know. Do I need to escape screen sharing to get to the slides? Um, you should be able okay. to just click right in the middle. Yeah, I know, and I should be able to advance from one slide to the other and... Or um, up and down arrows or... Yeah. But yep. it's not, that's okay. not doing it. Yeah, uh, we're just, we're gonna do it this way because I have some control over it and, and I'm not uh, at the mercy of my computer. Okay, so after you've taken the requisite... Let me see. Hmm? Let me see. see what? Can I still see this? Oh, I assume you guys can still see this. Yes, Beth? Yes, we see the passenger view. So after you've taken the re requisite tourist photo by the statue, you keep driving east from Manassa, and after a little bit, you'll see this, this rib of rock on the north side of the road. And if you can see that red exclamation point, it's hovering right over that rib of rock. Um, and there are some pretty easy, um, it's an easy turnoff because there's a Bureau of Land Management uh, signboards posted there right on the road. And this shows the crag from the turnoff. Um, it's about a mile and a half drive on a dirt road from the highway to the camping spot, which is shown there in the lower left. But I, I think even our Prius could handle this road, so it's, it's not too rugged. And the road takes you to this small parking area and camping area. And the Manassas Crag has been organized as six walls. And the names of the walls are noted in this photo. And after the names in the parentheses are the numbers of climbs in the guidebook for each of those walls. All the developed routes are on the south facing side, which is on the right in this photo. Um, so you get lots of good sun at this time of year. Um, one of the write-ups suggests that there's the potential for some hard climbs on the north side of the rock. And our uh, itinerant geologist who came on the trip, Steve Renault, said that the formation is most likely a volcanic dike. From the camping area, it's a short uphill hike uh, to the first climbs. The, the first rock you come to is called Manassa Cafe, but 
It is composed of espresso, robust, and goat walls. The developers divided the rock into three walls just for organizational purposes. Uh, the tree you see there towards the right um, is actually the arbitrary division between espresso and robust walls. And the hike from the car to the first climb is less than 10 minutes. So pretty mellow start. And I think the rock is just really cool and a lot of fun to climb on. Um, because it's south facing, uh, spring and fall are the best climbing seasons. Summer would be way, way, way too hot. Um, but I expect if you can get there in the winter, uh, you could climb comfortably on any sunny winter day. The guidebook recommends waiting until nighttime temps drop into the 30s so that the rattlesnakes go to ground. And the Bureau of Land Management also closes this area from mid-May to mid-July because of uh, raptor nesting season. I'm sorry, you can't see all of this. I'm gonna go back to full view and see if it will behave now. Okay, so Norbert found many things um, to like about the rock and many similarities with other climbing areas. Um, he thought the horizontal holds on the wall, which, of which there are many, are reminiscent of Diablo outside Santa Fe. And you got thin imbalanced edges similar to the rock at Red Rocks. And then the texture of the, and character of the rock uh, has some resemblance to Waco tanks, although there aren't so many Wacos here. Uh, but I think the Write Up and Mountain Project also notes that similarity. Ooh, it advanced, yay. The rock has lots of features, lots of crystals, and lots of friction. And in four days of climbing there, I did not experience a single foot slip, even when standing on very thin and tenuous features. And anyone who has watched me climb knows that that is not a testament to my technique, but really reflects the character of the rock. Uh, Steve enjoyed a lot of things about this crag. Uh, he especially liked the fact that he was able to climb in shorts in early November, but the setting and the ambience really stood out to him. We thought all the routes that we climbed on were well bolted, nothing to run out, and all reasonably rated. If you got on a 5.9, it sure as heck felt like a 5.9. So we very much enjoyed this. And as you can see in the photo of the right, uh, Norbert's got his mask on. We did, um, you pay attention to COVID um, safety uh, concerns and masked at the base of the climbs and when any time else we were in proximity to each other. Okay, here are two very well-matched climbers. Uh, when Norbert started up this route, the local climber on the right decided to follow him. I lost sight of the local climber at about bolt three. He was a little guy, smaller than my hand. But when Norbert was being lowered from the top of the climb, he saw the tarantula was still motoring upward, free solo all the way. Um, Steve noted the ambiance and the views and uh, they are pretty spectacular. Here's a view looking due south. Um, coming from this direction, we often thought we heard uh, brain in the distance and we thought that must be coming from wild burrows because there's no ranches or other things that we can see out in that direction. Here's a view to the southeast. Um, those mountains in the distance are the ones north of Taos. Uh, I'm going to call out two features in this photo in the next slide, but I'm going to give you a couple seconds to see if anything in the picture stands out to you. Did you spot them? You can see the Rio Grande from the crag and then Ute Mountain, which is just a really nice standout feature. And then looking west toward Manassa area um, in nothing but wide open spaces. And if you'll note where the campsite is in this photo, here it is up close. Um, that rock is a really nice feature for shelter from the wind. There are no amenities here, so bring your own water and be responsible with your waste. Camp spot's a great place to grab a chair and your favorite beverage and enjoy the sunset. You can tell this picture is from 2019 because of the lack of masks and the proximity of the two people. In 2019, we carpooled to the crag and our sleeping bags clustered next to the big rock where we weren't so uh, concerned about proximity. 
In 2020, we all drove separately. We made no stops in Colorado except at the crag and we maintained separation of the campsite. As I mentioned, we wore our masks whenever we were in proximity to each other, especially while getting tied in and on belay for the climbs. I really liked seeing the shadow of the crag on the neighboring hillside first thing in the morning. The nights were chilly, so some whiskey came in handy. We also used it to motivate Ron to the top of some climbs by telling him there was a bottle of red breast waiting for him up there. You know, this crag is really ideal in many ways for the moderate climber. Uh, this is just one of the warm ups on espresso wall. And this is the crag that is farthest from the campsite, farthest east, Cocopelli. I never ha have made it there, actually. We always get just worn out doing the other climbs before we get there. Um, but there's a four star 511 on this rock that I would love to try sometime. And if you were thinking of planning a trip there based on mountain project, uh, you might decide not to go since it only lists nine individual climbs. The description write up notes that there are more climbs, but the site gives details on only nine. But then there's a uh, climbing guidebook put out by Bob and Carrie Robertson that covers both Manassas and the Promised Land, another southern, southern Colorado crag. The Robertsons have developed many of the routes here, and the guidebook lists nearly 50 climbs. Um, we also discovered bolted routes not in the book, so there's still development going on there. So this may not be the right crag for climbers who warm up on 511s, but for the 5.9 and 5.10 climber, it is a really sweet spot. And it's one that I hope to get back to again next year. And thank you very much. Uh, happy holidays, holidays to everybody. And I believe Rod or Mike Fazio will take over from here. Yeah, Mike Fazio is somebody that I've known for a long time. And I knew him primarily from work. And it turned out we had lockers right next to each other in the gym at work. So I knew him as a avid runner and just a heck of a nice guy. And it wasn't until I really got involved with the Mountaineers that I realized he was uh, an adventurer too. Mm. So I was really happy to see that. And I have to say every year when I look at who all has paid their dues, I uh, am always happy uh, to see that Mike has done that even though he's lived in California for the, the past several years. So uh, let's welcome Mike Fazio. So thank you, Rod. And, uh, and John, that was a very inspiring presentation that I now have to follow. Um, but uh, good evening to everybody. I'm Michael Fazio here with my wife, Linda, uh, to share our experience uh, RV trekking the Intermountain West during the pandemic, also known as traveling, camping, and hiking while dodging COVID. Uh, as some of you know, in 2010, we left New Mexico for a two-year stint in the Bay Area at Slack, the DOE lab at Stanford, and two years has kind of turned into 10. But we still have our home in Santa Fe and we love New Mexico. So we were actually getting back to Santa Fe and Los Alamos almost on a monthly basis via Southwest Airlines until the pandemic hit in, in March when the shelter in place started. And by mid-May, realizing this wasn't going to be ending anytime soon and tired of being confined to the immediate area, we decided to try the RV approach. We wanted to be able to travel while fully socially distanced without having to stay in a motel, eat at a restaurant or use a public restroom. So we looked for something small, simple and quick. And the choice was a Sprinter RV like you see in the, in the pictures there. Uh, in the two weeks that we shot, we learned that the RV market demand was of course exploding since we wanted one. So we had to move quickly and settled on a used one. So since June, we've actually made uh, multiple trips to Santa Fe, to Colorado, and to visit our daughter in Los Angeles. Usually we take the most direct route down California's I-5 and then I-40 across to New Mexico, but we got tired of sleeping in the truck stops and the Cracker Barrel parking lots. So this trip that we described tonight takes the more leisurely scenic route. Now we, um, we departed the uh, San Francisco Bay Area in early October heading towards Santa Fe attempting to escape the fires and smoke uh, out here in our newly acquired pandemic certified sprinter uh, with an agenda of three national parks and two national monuments. Our route uh, that you can see on the map here is about 1,450 miles long crossing across Nevada, Utah and the 
clipping the edge of Colorado. Uh, we hit Great Basin, uh, Capitol Reef, and Canyonlands National Parks, and Bears Ears and Canyons of the Ancients National Monuments. And this, this trip really enabled us to hit you know, two of the really remote parks that we'd never been to before, Great Basin and Capitol Reef, because they're far from everywhere, whether you're in New Mexico or California. And we had to get all the way to Southern Utah before we got away from the smoke from the California fires. So heading east out of Reno, Nevada, um, we got on this Highway 50, US Highway 50, which uh, is the loneliest road in America for Life Magazine in 1986. And the road does indeed live up to its lonely reputation, but after driving around the Bay Area, it's actually a welcome uh, experience. Um, the right image up here at the top uh, was described on the map as a lake. Now you can see the tire tracks leading to the edge of the lake basin here. And, uh, and then you see a sign there, you can't see it in the picture, but the sign warned about driving on the lake bed because the surface is deceptively dry with uh, vicious vehicle consuming mud underneath. So we turned around and went back to the highway. Now, the Great Basin is, uh, is this large area that consists of mostly uh, of almost all of Nevada, Western Utah, uh, Southern Idaho and Southeast Oregon. Um, and it's a vast region of sagebrush covered valleys and narrow mountain ranges that run north south, like you see in the photo here on the left. Um, it's bordered on one side by the Sierra Nevada in California and on the other side by the Wasatch in Utah. And the name Great Basin comes from the fact that there's a very large lack of drainage. Uh, the, steam, the streams and rivers uh, mostly have no outlets to the sea. And geologists say that 15,000 years ago, waves from the Great Salt Lake uh, lapped the shoreline uh, 10 miles from the park boundary, uh, which is, is right here. That's the park boundary. And the Great Salt Lake today is 150 miles away here up near Provo. Um, our first stop was Great Basin National Park, which is remarkable in several ways. The first is it's remote, quiet, with low visitation. It ranks 53rd out of 62 national parks in terms of annual visits, and only three parks in the lower 48 have fewer visits per year. So put it on your list. Uh, it has a really absolutely fascinating bristlecone pine forest. Now, bristlecones are the oldest living things, uh, the oldest living or individual organisms, and the oldest one that we know of is about 5,000 years old. But I didn't know is they're also some of the oldest dead organisms. And the one in the photo is 3,000 years old and it died 300 years ago. There's an awesome day hike through the bristlecone forest about five miles long. One section of the trail is well marked uh, with these, these signposts that you see in the picture on the left. Uh, the list the age and other interesting data about specific trees that have been studied by scientists. And some of these trees were alive 500 years before the rise of Athens and many are two to 3,000 years old. And the wood is so compact and decay resistant that trees that died 600 years ago are still standing. You really have to have a lot of respect and admiration for these trees and their ability to survive. Um, interestingly, the longest lived trees grow near tree line where survival is, you would think would be most difficult. So adversity seems to lead to a long life. At the lower altitudes, they only live for about 400 years. So I guess the live fast and die young philosophy applies to trees as well as humans. And yes, there is another Wheeler Peak uh, in Great Basin National Park. Uh, however, at 13,065 feet, it plays second fiddle to New Mexico's Wheeler Peak. It's about 100 feet higher. We climbed it on our second day in the park and uh, hikes about nine miles and about 3,000 vertical. Uh, and it traversed the trail traversed through uh, spruce, fir, and aspen to alpine terrain. This is the summit ridge. Uh, you can still see the fires from the California, uh, the smoke from the California fires. Um, and uh, you, can, you can also see the, the nice uh, area at the start of the hike uh, at the lower elevation with a nice stream and meadow. Now on to Capitol Reef National Park, about 250 miles down the road. Uh, it's an oasis in the desert and the terrain is more like Utah's canyon country that we're all familiar with. Uh, the seven or eight orchards in the Fruita Valley that you see here in the middle uh, were planted by Mormon settlers in the late 1800s and are still producing uh, fruit. And they actually let you pick it. 
Um, and, and there in that valley is one of the best campsites, campsites we ever had. Uh, the place where we're standing taking the photo uh, is actually on the rim trail to the Navajo Knobs. And this is what, uh, this is actually the hike we did on the, toward the Navajo Knobs that mostly followed the, the rim, the canyon rim overlook. And the result of that is that you have spectacular views on almost the entire hike. So, um, you know, one of the things I always wondered about was where the name Capitol Reef came from, since you think of a reef as a nautical feature and not a desert feature. So, so this is a deal. Uh, there's a rock dome in the park that apparently reminded early travelers of the U.S. Capitol Dome. And that combined uh, with this, this great escarpment, this great barrier uh, escarpment, you know, reef, like you would have in the ocean, gives us the name Capitol Reef because the escarpment was a great barrier to east-west travel. Now the escarpment is a north-south wrinkle in the Earth's crust called the water pocket fold. It's a classic monocline for those for you geologists in the audience and it's about 90 miles long. It's the longest exposed monocline in North America and it's, it's the main reason it became a national monument in 1937. And 50 million years ago, the uplift that created the fold raised the western side 7,000 feet above the eastern side. The next stop uh, is Bears Ears National Monument, and you can see the, the Bears Ears up here at the top of the photo. Um, we considered this a must-see because it was established by Barack Obama in 2016, and Trump is trying to unestablish it. Uh, it it's a very wild and undeveloped area right adjacent to Canyonlands, uh, but most of the access roads there required high, high clearance that we didn't have in our vehicle. So we want to return sometime with the right vehicle and some good maps because you could easily spend a week there seeing amazing scenery, cliff dwellings, rock riding, and hardly any people. Our last stop was the Canyons of the Ancients uh, National Monument just outside of Cortez. And uh, it's interesting because all the times in the past, many, many times we had driven from New Mexico to hike and ski in Utah, we had never noticed this place before but it encompasses 176,000 acres of remote high desert canyons uh, with the highest concentration of archeological sites in the US. And the hike we're on uh, in the photo is called Sand Canyon. And it seemed like there was a cliff dwelling around every turn on the trail. It was just, just amazing. Um, now this is our la my last slide and shows our campsite along the Dolores River uh, here in, uh, uh, in Colorado near Cortez. Um, and uh, you can see the Aspen turning uh, around us. It was just a fabulous place to camp. And the bottom line here is that, you know, uh, an RV is a very safe and convenient way to travel during COVID. You're all self-contained, no motels, restaurants, or public restrooms. We only had to stop for fuel and for hiking. And uh, if anybody's interested in more information on the trip or RV travel, um, uh, feel free to contact me uh, anytime. And uh, with that, I will wish everybody a, a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. Over to you, Mags. Yeah, uh, Rod here, not Mags, but uh, Rod, yeah. Th thanks, Mike. And uh, yeah, kind of makes me wish I had a van. <laughs> so uh, yeah, great photography and yeah, sounds like a great adventure. Um, Mags Dale is somebody who I haven't really met. I did call her and uh, talk to her briefly so that I would have something to say. But uh, she tells me she did grow up. Uh, you know, her parents got her into outdoor adventure early um, and that she's into skiing, mountain biking, hiking. Um, she's lived here in Los Alamos about six years and has been active with the Mountaineers for maybe two or three years and mostly uh, hiking, but I'm hoping maybe she'll lead some ski trips after understanding what her talk is about. So let's welcome Mags Dale. Uh, okay, uh, thanks Rod for the intro. Uh, so um, in early March this past year, I did the Rihalta Raleigh Hito, I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation uh, that literally translates in English to from border to border ski. The, uh, the event is a classic style cross country ski across Finland. Um, it's been going on for 37 years 
and it consists of four groups of 70 to 80 people that start on staggered days. So I was lucky to be in one of the smaller groups of 42 people, which allowed for getting to know others a lot better. So we began northeast of Kusumo, near the Russian border, and then we ended 406 kilometers and seven days later, just north of Tornio on the Swedish border. Our ski days were anywhere from 44 to 88 kilometer days. Um, most days were 50 to 60 kilometers. The map here shows our long 88 kilometer day. So there are aid stations every uh, 10 to 15 kilometers marked here. And we were given a guidebook showing the stops, the distance, and general guidelines to prepare us for the adventure ahead. So I went on this trip with two friends from grad school. We all met up the night before at the Kusumo airport where my luggage was nowhere to be found. So luckily my friends were similar sizes and had spare gear that was actually better ski gear than I had. So it all worked out pretty well. And I was even a bit sad when my luggage did show up and I had to give them back their skis. So um, most days we were shuttled a few kilometers to the start of the ski trail and we all started out once and quickly spread out along the trail length. A snowmobile runs sweep and then can shuttle people if needed. So we follow the signs with kilometer markings that say how far we have gone and sometimes when the next aid station is. The people at the aid stations usually do this as a fundraiser for local groups. We actually met one group that was raising money for their number one youth basketball team in Northern Finland. So the, the first day's lunch spot was actually quite memorable. We came up over a hill and saw all these uh, reindeer at a small little farm. And then we went into a teepee for our uh, lunch, which ended up being reindeer soup. <laughs> and we were sitting on all kinds of reindeer skins, but it was really a, a special experience. We also, there's also a sled dog farm that was based out of there. And there is um, a nice cafe where we tried some Finnish monkey donuts, which are really good. So in the evening, um, we usually got an overview of the next day's ski tour by our group leader, who's Tiejo Sernio. Um, and on the first day, everyone gave an introduction and talked about where they are from. So our group consisted of Polish, French, Swiss, German, Italian, Swedish, Danish, um, and Finnish people. They're all across a wide range of ages. And then in the evening, there's always uh, time for sauna and then also time to wax skis, usually in that sort of priority. So the mornings were really pretty busy with all 42 of us getting out of the hotel on time and, and we're getting our skis and gear out of the bus and heading out to the start. The, the days were pretty long and the weather was sometimes snowy, rainy or windy. Uh, we were lucky the temperatures never really got below the teens. Um, but even with these weather conditions, there's very good spirit along the way. And we ended up skiing in both large and small groups. There's lots of conversation, at least in the mid to slow group that I was in. So it made for a great, great way to get to know our fellow skiers and learn more about them. Sometimes I ended up skiing alone or with one other person. Uh, a few days I skied with uh, Stuart, who's a photographer from Utah. He's also new to classic skiing. so. We were taking it easy, taking a lot of photos along the way. We also passed a reindeer farm around the way, right around this spot. Um, and then we, on this uh, more narrow wooded trail, we heard what we think were moose uh, in the area, which is pretty cool. Um, it was also always really great to see this sign, especially this one, because um, the teepees were quite cozy 
for having some snacks. A lot of the, some of the aid stations were historic spots and some had some pretty lively volunteers who had been helping out for many years. Um, the bus was also waiting at a few of the aid stations in case there was interest in not completing the full ski day, which I definitely took advantage of a few times. Um, on this day, we skied to the base of a small ski area, probably about the size of Pajarito, and then we took the tow rope to the top to stay at this ski lodge. Um, we were all really impressed because the Swedes just kept skiing that day and were effortlessly telemarking all around the mountain on their Nordic skis. Um, so you'll see a little bit of hills there. And then the next morning, we of course had a very exhilarating and cold descent down to the valley. This is a probably the most memorable spot we stayed at um, called Ronan Pirti which is a summer camp that started in the 1940s. And uh, I believe it hosted some Finnish Olympians over the years. So we are, arrived here and were greeted by a polar bear representative from the nearby Arctic Zoo. Um, we walked into this place and it has just one large big sleeping area um, with mattresses spread out everywhere. And it's divided into the men's side, which is shown here and then on the women's side. For most of the time, we stayed in hotels or hostel type places with two or four people in a room. So this group sleeping area kind of made for quite a lively evening with everyone. Um, this is kind of a nice stop along the lake. And here's my friends, Kara and Marin. Marin's actually from Minneapolis and the Nordic ski shop, um, there is called Ski Sisu, is run by a Finnish guy. And so she had this jacket that said Ski Sisu on it. And all these Finnish guys are wondering where she got it from, because it turns out that Sisu is a Finnish concept that's difficult to translate into English. Sorry, I'm back. Um, so it turns out that Sisu is a it's a Finnish term for grit, tenacity, resilience, and hardiness, which is exactly the type of characteristics you need to do well on this ski trip. Um, so there are, there are lots of, uh, well, trails along the way were mostly two tracks through rolling hills with pine, spruce, and birch boards. There's a few days where we skied through some marsh and lake areas. On this day, I skied with Angelica. She's from Germany and she was doing this trip for the eighth time. Uh, many people in our group came back year after year to do this trip. They enjoyed it so much. Uh, some of the ski conditions were well-groomed and maintained areas. We went by a few touristy spots um, where they had sled dogs set up for rides. This is in Rovanimi, which is near the North Pole, the Arctic North Pole. Um, this is also a nice lunch spot with a lean-to. There's always very creative use of items that the Finnish had. And of course, everything was on skis so that they could easily move it around. There's some nice international decorations here, but our Polish friend pointed out that all the flags, the attendees except Poland, were listed. Um, here's some fun sights along the way. We have uh, this guy's wearing the traditional Finnish cross country ski wear um, from the 1940s. And there were about 10 or so road crossings, and it was always Nice to have folks out helping us cross the roads and also get to see a bit more civilization. And of course, we have the Finnish cheerleading snowman. Um, the last day was pretty fun. I, I was happy I got to use my skate skis this day since all the trails were groomed. We also had some more of the Finnish Mookie donuts, which are cardamom flavored yeast donuts. Um, 
We had a nice crossing at the end with all the flags lined up. We had some excited uh, high schoolers who were dressed up in costumes to cheer us on, which is fun. And then that evening, we uh, each nationality did a brief skit talking about their culture. It was pretty fun and enjoyable. And overall, it was a great way to wrap up this unique trip experience. So thanks for your attention. Uh, sorry for the interruptions and hope everyone has a happy holidays. Well, thanks. That's kind of uh, got me excited about some cross country skiing coming up soon, I hope. <laughs> Next, we have Joy Whittle. She's been on the board, I think for a couple of years now. Uh, so I've gotten to know her yeah, about once a month, <laughs> but uh, I've been on some trips with her too. And uh, she's just one of the sweetest, nicest and cheerful people I know. And uh, I think you're gonna see from her talk that she's also a tough adventurer. So welcome Joy Whittle. And Rob. So Rob's going to get on too. Are you there, Rob? We're yeah, I'm on. I'm we're on. Dates right now. And I know you guys are tired of hearing me talk, but this was super fun. So Rob and I are going to do this together. Um, yeah, everybody knows uh, Joy, but very few people know me, even though I go on a lot of trips. So uh, I'll be <laughs> joining Joy with this uh, presentation. Well, Rob's been canyoneering a long time and pretty adventuresome. I'm a little more new to it. But I'm not new to water and I love, I grew up in Hawaii jumping off cliffs with my dad. <clears throat> and my thing was if my dad jumped first, I would always jump in. So when Rob um, heard about his friends going on the seven teacups, he said, this is a must for me. So the seven teacups are in Kernville, California. Uh, the Kern River is northeast of Bakersfield, California on the southern Sierra Nevada. It's fed by the snow melt near Mount Whitney, and it's home of some of the best sea canyons and swift water in USA. Um, yeah. yeah, like Joy said, I, I wanted to go on this uh, for many, many years. And so it was uh, something that, uh, you know, we, we just couldn't pass by, uh, even though it was a long drive. It's about a 14 hour drive from Los Alamos. So it's not for the faint of heart if you, if you choose to go there. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's a, it's a great canyon, extremely, well, probably one of the best and my most favorite canyon of all time. Well, so we went, um, the day before, we did uh, a canyon called Upper Jump. We got there about in the middle of the day, set up camp and had a couple hours to do this short canyon. The approach was terrible. <clears throat> There's just so much driftwood and muck and you just kind of had to walk through it. We had a lot of um, encounters with wildlife. We got attacked by a swarm of wasps and then Rob had an encounter with um, Western Diamondback. So uh, this, uh, this Diamondback was pr probably the biggest rattlesnake I've ever seen in my life. It was literally seven feet long and it was bigger than my my biceps. <laughs> I like the idea of maybe hiking it when it's only 30 degrees so they go underground. Um, but the last rappel, you come off this rock and come down through this grotto and it was just fast. It was just absolutely breathtaking. And then when you turn around, the rock that we were on looked like this big alien. It was, so that was, I don't know if I do the approach again, but that rappel was, was really cool. So on to the next day. Rob, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Yeah. The, uh, if you, you, the way you get there is you go to Kernville and then you go up the Kerns Canyon right next to the, the Kern River. And I did the Kern River uh, whitewater rafting about, uh, what, 13, 14 years ago. And so at that time, I'd heard about the seven teacups and I've <clears throat> been intrigued with them ever since. But the, the way you get there, and if you look at the, uh, P where the parking is, uh, you go to the <clears throat> the Johnson the Johnsondale Bridge, and you park there, and then you drive up the take a shuttle. There's there's two ways of, to get up there. We wanted to go with the way that had the shortest hike and the easiest, and so we went ahead and did a shuttle. You take the, your car up to if you can see the little uh, green light. The I guess yeah, right there where 
Joy's um, cursor is. So you take that curse, <clears throat> you, you take that trail up. It's about 1.8 miles, so it's not not a terrible hike, and it's not not very uh, much elevation or anything like that. So it's a great hike, and <clears throat> and then once you uh, drop into the canyon, uh, then it's about a two and a half mile hike from the you know at the end of the canyon back down to the Johnsonville uh, Johnsonville Bridge. Okay. Here's a great shot of the seven teacups. You can kind of get an idea of how it got its name. Um, and, and that's Dry Meadow Creek. So where we hiked up was dry, to Dry Meadow Creek where, where the tributary flows into the Kern River and over the, you know, it's just cut all these potholes into the granite. Um, it can be very treacherous treacherous when the water is high. So you need to really read the beta and understand the water level. It's best traversed in the summer months. So we did this on Rob's birthday on a July, very hot, hot July day. And because it had been on his bucket or teacup list <laughs> for a long time. And here's another aerial shot. So this is where we came in hiking in around here to where the pools start. And, and this is where we access. So you can see the different teacups right here. And then there's some potholes and this big waterfall rappel, and then you end up in the Kern River down here. Yeah, so there's a lot more to it than just the seven teacups. There's a, a, a lot of, like Joy said, a lot of potholes and a lot of pools. There's some swimming and, and some sliding and, and some jumps all the way along. So it's a lot more than just the seven teacups. Yeah, so if you like water, and, and we're just, we're not gonna do a lot of beta on this or anything, you can look this up. We're just gonna show you some highlights. So this is Rob getting ready. The water was very, very cold, even though it was a very hot day. Um, and so it actually felt good at first to jump in the water. So we start here at the first at the top and you just kind of climb around and slide down. And right here, there's a little arch. And that's how you judge the water. If the arch is submerged, then you know you're in high water area. But we just kind of ducked our heads and, and went under the, under the arch. And, um, this, then we came to the first pool and did our first jump. So happy birthday, Rob. So that was, that was super fun. And some people repelled down this way. There's always kind of an easier way down, but sometimes jumping is the best way. Oops, I already did that. Okay, and then we came to another area that had a big waterfall. The part that I had trouble with is that um, I didn't have the hydro shoes that are real sticky when wet. So my, my shoes are a little slippery and there's just no footholds. There's no, I mean, it has been worn smooth over the years from the water. And so I did a lot of it scooting on my bum. <laughs> but we came to this waterfall and they were getting ready to set up the rappel. So here's the rope here that they're getting ready to set up on the rappel. Oh. I'll interject a little something there. It was a really interesting, go back to the one before that, uh, Joy. <clears throat> As we were uh, putting a, a, rep a rappel in place over to the far left out, outside where you can't really see this, one of our guys that had been there before, you know, we, we saw the anchor and we thought, okay, we'll just rappel off this. Well, all of a sudden we looked at him and he was just taking, took off running towards the cliff. We were going, what are you doing? And, and he just went and just jumped right into the, the uh, pool. It was about a 35 foot uh, drop. So then we thought, well, yeah, we, he can do that because he's crazy. But then a few minutes later, then come up, all of a sudden comes Joy. <laughs> she just jumps off. And so once, once Joy jumped, then everybody said, oh, well, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> we'll just bag the rappel and, and the rest of us jumped after that. Yeah, so then Rob had to go second because I went in first. <laughs> and we're not, um, we're definitely not the youngest of, of this group. <laughs> so there goes Rob. And they call this the washing machine. It's kind of churny. And, um, and then you yeah, swim. In up. fact, most of the people on the group were about half our age. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we try not to tell them. And then there's an area you swim out of this washing machine into this other pool. And when I turned around, Eric, our leader, was clapping. And everyone thought he was clapping because I jumped, but he was clapping because I actually was able to get out of that pothole by myself. And it was slippery. And I did the whole spread eagle and wiggled my fingers and 
and got up on my own. I was pretty proud of that. So, um, and then, so then the next one after that is the repel, a big, it's the longest repel, 60 foot repel, and you're repelling down this gorgeous waterfall. And our friend, the guy that jumped first, was hanging off another rope and able to just get these, capture these amazing photos. These, they're just priceless for us to be hanging off a waterfall on this gorgeous day. It was super fun. And this is our friend, Eric, and he and, and, and Brett, the guy that had jumped first, had just gone there a couple of weeks before. So they were very, very familiar with the water levels, where to jump, where it was deepest. And so we always felt very comfortable with them. And this is what it looks like coming down. This is why you have to repel because you're in, it comes into this um, little um, chute, little of rock and the water just churns and churns down in there. So on that one, you have to make sure your rope is set just right. Otherwise, if you don't set your rope right, it's you know typical swift water repelling where you got to just make sure you repel off the end of your rope or else you're going to uh, get swirled around in the water and it could be very dangerous. And the yeah. same thing is, is happening on this next one, which is called the corkscrew, where you have to make sure that you repel off the end of the rope and have the rope shorter, much, much shorter than the, <clears throat> than the uh, drop so that you can repel off the end and go into the water at the end of it. Yeah, that was surprising to me. Takes on a new meaning of being at the end of your rope, literally, because you're just coming down and then you just free fall the last um, four or five feet into the water and so that you don't get tangled up in your rope and, and, get, um, and you can't unclip. And, and, and this, uh, this corkscrew right there, <clears throat> the water, even though it was relatively low, um, it's claimed the life, life of few people just because um, it, it turned so much at the end, even, if, even though they, at, under high water conditions, as people drop off it, they just get caught in the, in the uh, washing machine down below. And, and so it's a, it could be very treacherous if the water is, is not at the right height. If it's yeah, right. it, was, it was a good waterboarding experience, I would say. And here's some more series of, of pools that you can jump into or slide over or shimmy down around the sides. Like I said, it's pretty smooth and slick. And then we came to the bottom of this one, which is just a water slide. And we're just coming through and just jumping off the next one. And um, it, it was just super, super fun. I, I really, we really just had a blast with that. And then when we get to the very end, this is the last pool that drops you into the Kern River. And everyone went first and they kept saying, you gotta go fast, you gotta go fast. Well, I get a little nervous about going fast. So I'm kind of scooting my way, getting going. Obviously it'd be easier if the water was a little high, but they're saying, go faster, go faster. And I go to the left and the, there's a really narrow channel with the rock and, and my lucky rock, my lucky helmet saved me. So that was the same helmet that I got hit with on a rock the week before. And, um, and it saved me again. So then Eric showed us how to do it to get lots of speed. <laughs> and he went off. And then Rob tried to get a bunch of speed. Oh, lost his footing a little bit, but then he got up and came up and over and dropped right down into the Kern River. So <laughs> it's just, it's like a giant water slide for adults. It really is. That's the only way I can yeah, say. It's definitely an adult water park. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, let me get this here. And then we end up in the Kern River and the Kern River was really warm. And this time of year, it was really slow. So we were just kind of, you can come across and hike back to the Johnsondale Bridge about two and a half miles. But we decided to float quite a bit of it. And we had our back. All of our yeah, all of our backpacks were uh, had floaters in them. We'd put, purposely put uh, the water water weenies into our backpacks so they'd float real well. So we used our backpacks in front of us as we went, or behind us depends on how it was. And you put your feet forward and you just uh, float down the river and use your feet to kick away from the rocks. We did that until it got to be a little bit too rough towards the end, and then we got up and hiked out. 
And I'll tell you, by then my legs were rubber, trying to fight the current and balance on the rocks and not slip. Um, it wasn't a long canyon, but it, we did spend most of the day doing it. And, um, and it was quite strenuous, but, but pretty fun. So then we end up at the Johnsondale Bridge and there's the parking lot there. And that's where we got our shuttle car back and, and ended up at the Johnsondale Bridge. So super fun time. Right now it's closed um, until the end of the year because of all the wildfires and things like that. And so um, they are keeping people out of that area, but it is a very popular place to go on a hot summer day. So thanks, thanks Rob for taking me. And oh, you're welcome. Thanks everybody for listening. Merry yeah, Christmas this, to everybody. This was, this, this, I would highly recommend it. If you ever uh, have a, you know, any, you want an, a real good adventure and don't mind driving 14 hours, this is really the place to go. Uh, again, it's one of my very favorite canyons. So thanks everybody. Merry Christmas. Go yep. ahead, Joy. Bye. Uh, back to you, Rob. Rod. Well, thanks. That was uh, great. Great photography. And I think a lot of people's uh, bucket lists just got one item longer. That looks, looks really good. And for our last speaker, Melanie Hand. Um, really didn't know her until I've been on the board with her for the, the past year. So uh, I know she's ambitious, loves the canyoneering and has lots of big plans for the club for the next year. So uh, I think we're all looking forward to that. So let's welcome Melanie Hand. I, I um, want to just give a very short introductory to uh, technical canyoneering for those who aren't familiar with the sport, but I hope to also um, provide a, a, an example of how we could possibly create additional session lessons uh, by our mountaineers on a variety of different subjects that are dear to your heart. So um, basically my uh, short presentation tonight is going to be on technical canyoneering during a worldwide pandemic. Um, and uh, my husband, David, um, is always my companion on all these uh, canyons. So. I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, he was also given credit for um, all these canyons that we explore. And Melanie, if you'd like to make your screen um, full screen, uh, start that slideshow on the bo uh, bottom right, right by the minus sign. That'd be great. Okay. That uh, looks good. So anyway, uh, if you've ever seen pictures like this and uh, you said to yourself, wow, that really looks fun. Or if you looked at uh, the Whittles photos and said, wow, that's exciting. Uh, then this is probably a sport for you. Let's see, how do I advance? Where? Oh, okay, so... Um, Basically, we'll just talk about how you would get started um, doing some canyoneering, uh, some of the planning stages uh, to consider, and then I'll just go through some of the highlights for canyons in New Mexico, especially since we have a lot of uh, restrictions on travel these days. I just thought I'd talk about some of the canyons that are very close. Um, these are only a few of um, a variety of canyons that uh, uh, you have an opportunity to explore. So um, basically the, the neat thing about canyoneering, uh, especially when you're in a pandemic, is that uh, we have a lot of very remote areas in New Mexico. Um, you can go into a canyon um, and not see anybody else um, when you are canyoneering in New Mexico, which is really nice um, when you're trying to stay away from people. Um, and uh, it's very beautiful. And it's also a good way to um, get in some practice for some of the larger adventures in other states. 
So some of the um, personal skills that you should um, consider when you're looking into um, canyoneering is uh, you probably want to read and um, practice locally. If you can hire a certified trainer or go with some experienced uh, companions, I would highly recommend that. Um, there's a lot of problem solving involved because the conditions change um, in the canyons, um, depending on the seasons, um, water, et cetera. There are a lot of different changes. So any kind of uh, beta that you may read in a book um, may not be completely accurate and you may have to do some of your own problem solving when you get into the canyon. It uh, demands teamwork, but your teams can be pretty small. Uh, Dave and I, uh, we were our own team for canyoneering during this pandemic. And, um, you know, basically that's all you really need is uh, two people um, when you're canyoneering. Um, another thing that is really important, especially when you go with uh, larger groups or when the, you do see other people in the canyons is try to learn the um, canyon etiquette. And some of the books that you can uh, read will discuss that a little bit more. Uh, I highly recommend that if you do sign up for a canyon to with you know some of your friends or uh, you know companions that you look to share the work and balance the load. There are lots of things that you can do. Um, if you've got some people who are setting up the repels, you know, uh, even the least experienced uh, canyoneers can help stuff the rope back in the bag when we're done pulling the ropes, et cetera, or carrying a rope, you know, to the next repel. All those things are really important to help balance the load when you're on a uh, canyon. Oops, excuse, oops. Um, Regarding gear, uh, highly recommend that you consider getting a GPS. Uh, maps are nice, but a GPS is better. Uh, the length of ropes and the number of ropes that you bring is very important. Make sure that you study that in advance and um, you know, consider who's going to carry those ropes and um, you know, what makes sense for the types of repels that you're going to do to the, the length of the rope that you're going to need. You need to think about special technical gear as well and attire for different types of canyon conditions. Uh, Joy mentioned her shoes. And if you are planning to do a lot of canyons with water, you know that might be something that you want to invest in are some of the uh, shoes that are made for going through wet canyons. Another thing is whether it's a wet or dry canyon, you really need a tough backpack. Uh, it's very abrasive in these canyons and uh, you can tear up your clothes, your backpacks, everything. So um, there are a, a variety of things that you can uh, purchase to help prevent having to buy a whole new set of gear every time you go in a canyon. Here are a couple of starter books. If um, you are totally new to canyoneering, uh, the Falcon Guide Canyoneering book is a very good introductory uh, guide. And um, New Mexico Slot Canyons is what Dave and I have used to explore some of the local slot canyons in New Mexico. Um, I heard that, that it may be out of print, but that he has a lot of this information, Doug Scott has this information on his website. So um, you can search on that and uh, find a lot of this information uh, on the web. So some of the things that you can do, especially during the winter months when um, we're waiting for the, the next canyoneering season, which is usually spring, is uh, learn knots. Um, you can get phone apps that 
help you learn knots. Uh, knots 3D is something that you can purchase for a very small uh, price, and it will uh, actually have an animated uh, tying of knots and, and a whole variety of different types of knots that you can use for different kinds of applications. Um, also online on, on your computer, you can get something called animated knots. But um, there are a variety of different knots that come in very handy when you're out uh, in the canyons. And uh, some of the ones that we prefer are lowerable block anchors, meaning that uh, you, know, you are able to lower somebody on that rappel if for some reason um, you didn't put out enough rope. Um, to get to the bottom of the rappel. Um, there are a lot of other emergency types of knots that you learn. Uh, the Munter Mule with an overhand lowerable block is something that's on the lower right-hand picture. And that was something that we practiced in a session, a training session uh, that Dan Kreveling had organized um, a couple of a couple of summers ago, and it was with Rich Carlson, who's uh, a certified uh, instructor in this subject. Some of the other kinds of things that uh, you want to learn about is how you do a ghosting anchor. Um, you can see that in the left picture, uh, there are a lot of marks on the rock where people basically have worn uh, the rope on the rocks and, and you know you try to avoid that kind of thing when uh, you're going through the canyons so that you can leave uh, you know no trace. There are a lot of different uh, canyon ratings and like for example the uh, rating of the canyon that you saw Rob and Joy do was a 3C3 which is flowing water. There are two other types of uh, ratings, a 3A2 or a 3A3. Um, those are dry canyons, or uh, I, I should say they're mostly um, dry. Uh, if you have a big rainstorm uh, the night before, you might not find that it's a dry canyon. <laughs> you, you may find a lot of pools that uh, you need to um, wade through. Uh, 3B2 or 3B3, um, that's a still water uh, type of canyon where you will possibly do wading and swimming. And then the flowing water is the 3C. Uh, when we call it a two or a three, uh, two is just, you know, the, the length of uh, hours that it takes to get through a canyon. So like a, a 3A2 would take you maybe four hours to get through, and a 3A3 may take you six to eight hours to get through the canyon. Some of the other types of uh, canyon features and risks that you will find are keeper potholes. Uh, Joy talked about this in her last presentation. Uh, route finding is also a real challenge, which uh, if you do learn how to use a GPS, that can be very instrumental in, in keeping you safe, getting through a canyon. Um, difficult exits are another uh, concern. In some canyons, they actually recommend that you ascend right back up. So you'll rappel down the canyon and then you'll have to use ascending gear to, to get back up, which means you have to leave ropes in place um, so that you can go back you know, ascend back up your ropes as you, you know, come back up through the canyon. Um, there are a lot of unknowns that a uh, book won't tell you about, um, which, you know, to some people that's challenging and fun. Other people that's very scary. So it just depends on your personality and, and uh, you know, what sounds fun to you. But um, anyway, uh, you know, some of the other things that you consider are the logistics uh, with loop hikes or if you stage cars or whatever, and that is something that you should work out with the team uh, that is going to um, pursue a canyon adventure. 
here's a picture of an ascending, you know, basically me ascending back up the canyon wall. And uh, so you just have to use slightly different gear to do the ascending. But I found that when we did this over in the Vermilion Cliffs area, we did this in uh, Badger Canyon, um, you know, it was definitely preferred to ascend back up the rappels than to go through a, a very um, laborious, hot, miserable hike out. So um, I'm sold on, you know, if you have the right equipment, ascending can be a lot of fun too. Um, I had mentioned something about uh, signing up for certified instructor training. Um, they, you know, have uh, insurance and they make sure you're safe. So you'll notice the redundancy in the ropes that uh, you see in that picture. So basically I'm being belayed at the same time that I'm repelling. For people who are used to repelling, that's not a whole lot of fun. But if you're first learning, this, you know, gives you a little bit more confidence um, when you're first trying out canyoneering. Um, and regarding practicing locally, uh, one of the places that uh, I enjoy um, is the Pajarito Canyon in White Rock. Uh, it has about four rappels. Uh, they're pretty good uh, rappels. I, you know, as far as distance, I'd say they're probably around 75 feet um, in length. And um, you have a decent hike uh, getting back out of the canyon. But, um, you know, you, you can do it in a loop and uh, the scenery is quite beautiful and you can do all of it in half a day. So, um, you know, it, it's a very good way to practice. And um, because White Rock is a little warmer in the, in the winter months, you can go down there quite late in the season uh, to practice when it's dry. Another place that we go, which is very close uh, in Los Alamos, is uh, right at the end of San Ildefonso Road. And uh, basically, you just go into the drainage, and you can see the, the cliffs um, from, the, um, from the road itself. But you basically just get into that drainage, and then you have a series of about four rappels uh, with the uh, last rappel shown on the right picture there. You you um, basically climb right through that crack in the top. You can see it in the middle picture too, just uh, right in the middle of the, uh, in the picture that you'll see a chalk rock and then you'll see kind of this uh, little, little S shaped, um, you know, piece of light. Well, that's the same thing that's in the, the last photo uh, where you basically go through that slit in the rock and then rappel down into that beautiful, um, um, what do you want chamber. to call it? Chamber. <laughs> and Dave's uh, rappelling on the, on the um, right picture that just shows one of the other rappels in that canyon. So this one, this particular canyon is super remote and we've never seen anybody in that area, even though it's right here in town. So here's a listing out of Doug Scott's book. Uh, shows a lot of different canyons um, that you can explore. Uh, some of them are not tech technical. So uh, you could possibly do some canyons that uh, are in warmer parts of the state in, uh, in the winter months and then move into the cooler parts during the summer. Uh, I'll just run through these pictures very quickly because I know we're running out of time, but um, you know, these are some canyons that we found um, sort of in the Abiquiu area, it's called Gaina. Uh, it's a private ranch um, where we took a mountaineer's trip and um, and then we explored some places and this was a canyon that 
you know, the canyon, the slot area didn't even have a name. So we just call it No Name Canyon. Um, here's Big Canyon that's also accessed from Guyena Ranch or Forest Road 8 over by, um, uh, let's see, Coyote. And Talus we did just recently in October. You'll, you can tell because I've got a mask on. We went with one other person. And uh, so when we got into the narrower parts of the canyon, uh, we put on masks. But uh, that one has uh, about four repels. And then after you uh, practice in New Mexico with all the, the different canyons that are local, there are so many opportunities out there in the three adjacent states of Arizona, Colorado, and Utah to um, explore more challenging canyons and some beautiful scenery. And uh, the, the neat thing is, is it's all within uh, eight hours drive. So um, anyway, I highly recommend that uh, if you're interested in canyoneering that you stay home or local and uh, you know, take that opportunity for socially distanced outdoor activities. And, um, you know, last message is uh, please uh, consider developing your own session lesson to uh, support ongoing interest in outdoor activities you love. Thanks again. And have a happy holiday. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of Peak, uh, we just really, really enjoyed uh, having this partnership with the Mountaineers. And like Zach and Melanie were saying, you know, we hope next year uh, brings even more of you know, sharing this time outdoors. And and um, our, you know, I've I've really enjoyed our our monthly meetings. So uh, yeah, we hope to see everybody back in the new year. Uh, I hope everyone has a really safe and happy holidays. And with that, um, unless Joy, you have anything else or Melanie, I will go ahead and end it. Nope, I think we've had our time. It's wonderful. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks everyone for tuning in.